Family is everything. My dad didn't get a chance to consider it. He died before I was even in the picture. As far as I knew, all I ever had was my little brother Keldon and my mama Terry. Although you best believe if we ever called her anything besides mom or mama, she would jury her off. We relied on each other for strength, especially hers after grandma died. Growing up in the streets of South LA, we didn't have much other choice. She would wake us up every morning and get us dressed for school. Mom was our bus driver in the mornings, taking Kelvin to the elementary school and me to middle school. Her wages couldn't afford us the best clothes, so the moment we stepped off the bus, you best believe that we were struggling. My shoes were barely hanging on my feet, and I hadn't had a good shower in a few days, but Mom kept reinforcing that what mattered most was getting our education. She worked herself to the bone for us. I didn't know it at the time, but after she got done with the bus route, she would bus tables at a diner just down the street from our school. The only way I found out was because one day I played hooky, stopped in there for a bite to eat. When mom saw me, I had probably been crying for a good 20 minutes. Some girl wrote a nasty note and stuck it on my locker, and I just wanted to hide from the world. When we locked eyes, I didn't know if she was going to tear me up or hold me in her arms. I think a lot about those days. What with the world the way it is now. I have kids of my own now, and I keep telling them things have gotten better. Then I turn on the news, and I... It feels like I'm right back in 7th grade again. There's one experience that always comes to mind, and one I'm going to share with you now. That's the one I often tell people about when I had something I really needed to say. Given what the world is like now, I guess... I feel like sharing it with anybody who will listen. It was a week after Easter and Mom had lost her job. Our grandma had died not long back, and ever since then it seemed like we had lost our way, especially her. Working double shifts at the diner had exhausted her to no end, and she wound up missing the afternoon route. Rather than hear her out, her manager showed her the door, and Mom picked us up on foot outside our schools. For a 12-year-old black kid, nothing was scarier than walking home from school, even with your mom holding your hand. Kids had to keep their eyes open for drive-bys, and if, if it wasn't that, there were fights all up and down the streets. The day wasn't any different. We were heading to our community center, which housed our local Baptist church for everything communion, and we heard gunshots rattle across the street. Mom held us close and we hurried into service to find a pew in the back to listen to Pastor Ken. For some reason I can't explain, I, I remember every detail of the sermon that day. It was about the Good Samaritan, how the priest and the Levite left a fellow Jew by the roadside, left him for dead. It made me think of my own circumstances. Why was it that nobody was helping us? I knew Mama asked these questions, because she was behind on tithes. Even that day after service, Pastor Ken was reminding her of our dues. Think of your children, Terry. Don't you want them to have a good relationship with God? He whispered. If I have to buy God's love for my children, it doesn't sound like that is the type of God I want to worship. Mom shouted back. She grabbed our hands and stormed out of the church, never looking back. I like to think that Pastor Ken meant well. The times were tough. Not just for us, but the whole neighborhood. Just on the way home, we heard police sirens and shots at least three times. It felt like we were in a war zone. God had left South Central Los Angeles. That's what Aunt Naomi said. Mom talked to her a lot over tea, both of them gossiping about the latest news. She lived down the block in a rougher part of the city, but never seemed too worried. 
At the time, I didn't fully understand the significance of names like Rodney King and George Holliday. All I knew for sure is that Mama was worried. Tensions were high in the entire community. I keep telling you what you need to do, Terry. Stop wasting your prayers and get yourself a loa. The idol keeps your family safe. I've had mine for over a year, and since then I haven't had a single break-in. Papa Legda kept me safe, she said as she fumbled with her necklace. It reminded me of the tiki statues we had around New Year's. I remember thinking how amazing it looked when the light hit it just right. Naomi, enough of your voodoo nonsense. It isn't nonsense. You just don't understand the magic like I do. I remember Mama sighing as she finished making us supper. And where do I even find Aloha around here? Look around your shops. Your stores. That one over on 44th should have them this time of year. Even if I did want one, I couldn't afford it, sister. I... I lost my job today, she said. For a long time, Naomi didn't speak. And then she said something vulgar that I didn't understand, but it still made me laugh. But she didn't press the issue anymore. After supper, we took our baths and we got ready for bed, just like usual. Mom said she would try to walk us to school the next day and we needed to get some rest. We said a prayer together, and I remember Mama asked God to protect us, but that never happened. As we lay there and morning peeked through the blinds, we were trying to push out noise of the world around us, and then a knock came on our door. It was Mrs. Lau, the apartment landlord. Miss Terry, you're late today. Is everything okay? The older Korean woman asked softly. Behind her, we heard two men arguing in the stairwell, and Mom did her best to keep the door chain on. Two men we've seen in the streets, and Mama knew since they were children. I'm sorry, Miss Lau. I didn't get a chance to come and talk to you. It's been a day. The kids are sleeping, and... Before Mom got two more words out, the first man pulled a knife out. Mama yelled, Damar, stop this nonsense! Without even hesitating, Mama ran out to try and stop the fight. That's just the type of woman that she was. I remember hopping out of bed and watching as this grown woman stepped between two gang members. My heart was pounding. Mrs. Lau made a shriek, and the chaos that followed. Mom got sliced in the shoulder. Damar looked mortified by what happened and started to tend to her when he heard sirens blasting off in the distance. He said, I'm sorry, Miss Johnson, I'm so sorry. And ran away. It all happened so fast. And then, Kelton was trying to run them down as they both fled. And Mama fell to the ground. Oh my lord! Mrs. Lau said, coming to my mom's aid. I saw Keldon squeezing his fists together, and then he ran down the stairs. Mama screamed his name, but he wasn't listening. I followed instead. I tackled him on the alley outside our apartment. He kicked me for a minute, telling me to get off, but I was so scared that those men would come back, I held him down. Get off me, Keldon shouted. What's wrong with you? I'm going to the store. Find mom something that can help her get better. I'm tired of mama always suffering and us not able to really help, he said. I could see that he had calmed down, so I didn't question it. Instead, I insisted that I go with him. A soft fog was rolling in as we walked the early morning streets. Distant sounds of cars racing up and down main highways could be heard as we made it to the storefronts. In our neighborhood, it was a mixture of black, Korean, and Haitian that ran the streets, and most of them knew us. Most of the owners were glued to their televisions and watching something about the trial that Mom and Aunt Nicole had been gossiping about that night. We made it to the Haitian bodega and listened as well right in the doorway. 
The four officers involved in the case have been acquitted by a jury of their peers. Later today, Mayor Tom Brady and Chief Daryl Gates both plan to make statements. I saw a few familiar young men buying groceries and thought of the one that had gotten hurt in a stairwell. They often ran the streets together. Jamal, one of your boys nearly hurt my mama, I shouted angrily at the gang leader. He turned towards us, surprised by the outburst. God damn, I'm sure it was an accident. She all right now? Jamal asked. It sounded like a half apology. Yeah, this is how I was watching after her, but I don't know about your boy. He was banged up pretty bad, I said, keeping my eyes on the television. Where was this? Jamal asked. His sudden interest surprised me, and I panicked and told him. I wasn't sure how he was going to react. Kelton and I didn't get a chance to hear much else as the gang left. Then the entire store erupted in a clamor of yelling and frustration. It's a load of shit, one of our neighbors shouted. Instantly, the shop owner tried to calm everyone down, but it was clear that the news they had just heard was enough for them to not listen to sound advice. It ain't right, another one yelled. Another one shouted. Outside, I thought I heard some noise in the streets, too. Others were beginning to act out in their frustrations. I was a kid at the time, but I understood what was happening. I grabbed Keldon's hand and pulled him back from the storefront. Wait, Ashley, look. It's Aloha, he said excitedly, as he saw a nearby Haitian owner quickly closing shop. In the morning light, it looked like the idol was glowing. The once dreary morning streets of our community were suddenly turning into a protest as more people came out and started to congregate, each one angrier than the last. My heart was pounding as I stood paralyzed and watched a few people begin to get into fights. We need that for Mama, Kelton insisted. A second later, gunfire hit the streets. I tried to pull him back, but he didn't listen. He ran towards the store to try and talk to the Haitian, and then right before our eyes. The owner was shot in the chest. I pushed Keldon to the tile floor as more violence erupted and we hid under the store counter. We couldn't even hear ourselves think as the rioting got louder. It only took a few moments for looting and chaos to take shape in the neighborhood, and I knew if we hung around any longer, we could be next. We need to go back home, I insisted. The law, Keldon said as he scrambled to find it amidst the wreckage. He tucked the strange idol into his jacket as we ran. The noises didn't stop until we made it back to the house. Mrs. Lau was helping Mom get settled inside. Anne had made sure to treat her wounds. Keldon didn't say a thing about what we had gotten from the streets as we heard more violence emerging in our own apartment building. You must go. Make sure others are safe, Miss Lau told us, and then added, I'll return to take you to school. Once again, Mom gave us both a good tongue lashing. What is wrong with you going out like that? You know it ain't safe. She chided us, but she could tell that we were scared. The morning had changed dramatically for all of us, so she guided us into her arms, and she sang a soft familiar lullaby that she had done for years. I closed my eyes and listened to the melody. Hush, little one, don't say a word, she began, and I closed my eyes, listening to the melody. I kept Kelton from saying anything and apologized, especially because we had already missed the morning bell for school. And on the news, the riots were starting to spread across our part of South L.A. The whole world seemed to be going mad. In our rooms, Kelton took the loa and muttered, I hope this thing really works. I don't even know how it works, I admitted. Where did you get that? Mom asked, pushing the door open to look at the strange idol. It's for you. It's to help you, Kelton said innocently. She was too surprised to even get on to him, and instead picked up the idol and remarked, I guess we need all the help we can get. I watched as she left with it, looking at the idol like it was some kind of trophy. 
We didn't bother to follow. Lack of sleep from the night before and all our traveling had made us exhausted. But we didn't have time to sleep. Mrs. Lau was back to take us to school a few minutes later. We didn't even get to pack lunches. Hurry, hurry, our landlord said, grabbing our backpacks. Outside, we saw more people gathering in the streets. There had only been a few, it was now a couple of dozen. Some were forcing cars to stop, others looting stores. Mrs. Lau, I don't think it's safe, I said nervously as we climbed into her old station wagon. She locked the doors. We pulled out towards the road. I think we made it about two to four blocks. We saw people starting to riot all around us. Either they were marching to block the streets or they were vandalizing the neighborhood. At the first stoplight, several men started to climb on Mrs. Lau's car, screaming obscenities at her. Back up! Keldon screamed. Our landlord nervously tried to push through the crowd, but it wasn't working. We were slowed to a crawl, and it looked like going any further would be suicide. I said a silent prayer, unsure if it would even matter that we at least got home safe. One of the men fell off the car as we turned around. Mrs. Lau wisely realized that the neighborhood was becoming a war zone. Mrs. Lau hurried us back to our apartment. We parted ways. Then we darted inside. Mama? We called out to her, explaining we were home because the streets were turning into a war zone. We couldn't find her. No matter where we looked, we searched high and dry in the living room and kitchen. Places where she usually loved to be. Where was our mama? We decided to try her bedroom, but we doubted that she would be there. Mama always told us the bedroom is only for sleep and nothing else. It would become sloths if we lay in bed all day. We entered her bedroom and window open. We heard the escalating violence and looting. That's weird. Mama never had her window open, and I mean never. We made our way to the open window, hoping our mama didn't do something like... Jump. Pitter-patter, 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 pitter-patter. Pitter-patter of footsteps. Like someone was running around in the apartment, Keldon and I looked at each other in confusion and decided to follow the source of the sound, which seemed like it came from kitchen now. We tiptoed to the kitchen, hoping that it was Mama. The pantry door was open and swinging back and forth. Pitter, patter, pitter. Now coming from behind us in the bathroom. And a croaking groan that was getting louder by the second. We turned around and followed the groan. It was terrifying. It sounded like, like someone was trying to breathe, but was also choking at the same time. I clutched Keldon's hand, hoping that Mama would just playing some game with us. He called out. Mama? Scratch, 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 scratch. Swing from behind the shower curtain. Scratch, 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 scratch. It sounded like someone's nails were being ripped off of their fingers while scratching the wall. What we saw looked like Mama, but we can't be sure. A silhouette of a figure standing there. I mean, it was hunched over and it didn't look human. We could see their fingers moving at light speed, scratching the paint off of the wall. Scratch, 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 scratch. Mama... I slowly opened the curtain, and there she was. She was hunched over and facing the wall, but now still as a statue. We called out to her a few times, but she wouldn't move. Blood on the wall, and some symbol carved into the wall. Mama? Keldon took a step towards her when suddenly, crack, she stood upright. She then began to convulse like she was choking and hacking. She kept hacking when suddenly she vomited onto the bathroom floor. Only what came out wasn't vomit. It, it looked like, like dead skin, almost like dead snake skin. We looked up at Mama, and now she had turned towards us. Her eyes were yellow and black. She was drooling a black, viscous liquid and smiling at us. She started walking towards us. When I ran, 
Keldon was right behind me, dashing to grab something from the closet. I screamed for him and got to my room, turning my head to see he had stuffed some things into his backpack. What was he thinking? I grabbed him and I closed the door as my body quivered in fear. We locked the door and anchored down. But our nightmare had just begun. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. Or listening to tonight's podcast on the podcast, if you're listening to that there at Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you can happen to listen to podcasts. I also want to tell you guys, if you look in the description, there's a lot of really cool things that you can always see down there, including uh, links over to two Creepypasta books that I curated that are available now on Amazon. Check those out. The Creepypasta Collection Volume 1 and Volume 2. They're great for people that like horror or creepypastas or people who listen to this podcast. And of course, I wanted to give a big thank you to everyone who checks out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta and supports the show, keeps the light on, gives me treats for my now two cats, both Hylas and Hercules. Both of them are a handful. And especially a big thank you to Haha ha Saha, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mazakin, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chambinski, Nico Kao, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Diana Krauss, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Hades Nephew, Carter Barenfanger, Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Bradney Lipe, The Government Monitoring System, Anne Charon, Rumble Fox, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Rafael Rodriguez, Dan Sweet, Mad Marshdomp, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Sean Mills, Brian Arce, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Somber Puppet, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Patrick Schoolmeister, Thomas Burgett, Barbara Maceo, Bobby Carmen, Liam Newman, The Homeless Bird 93, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, and Corey X Kenshin. A big thank you to all of you guys and everybody down there in the description. I really can't thank you guys enough for supporting the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everybody who listens, sweet dreams. <laughs>